All right. Good morning. All right. Okay. I'm, I'm talking this way today. This is the, the, the fullest section. Sorry, guys, over there. <laughs> All right. Welcome to Grace This Morning. I'm so glad that you guys could join us today. Um, my name is Stephanie. I am the associate pastor here at Grace. Um, so I'll be bringing the message today. Um, it was kind of a last-minute switch. Um, Mark Bird from Revive Ohio, um, a ministry that we worked with about a year ago and still continue doing our no-show be with, um, was supposed to be bringing the message today, but he ended up really sick last week. So I found out Friday that I was preaching today, so here we are. <laughs> it's fine. It's good. Um, <clears throat> Before I forget, because it's me and I'm forgetful, um, also on my left, your right over here, is our board for prayers for our next pastor. If you'd like to add anything to that after service, please do so, so, so we can continue praying in that direction, okay? Um, we have been in the middle of a series on the book of James, and so today we are continuing in that, starting in chapter four today, and so our focus verse for this series um, has been, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says, right? And to go with that, the question, our serious question, do you have a genuine knowledge of faith or genuine faith in action? And just that challenge of, do we just know it and we know what we're supposed to be doing, we know what genuine faith and having faith is, or are we actually living it in our life? And just keeping that in front of us uh, as we've gone through this series. And so the last few weeks we, we've talked about the first three chapters of James, how God wants you to see your promised land and the things that he has called to you in your life right now. He wants us to testify not only with your words, but also in our actions, right? He asked us the question, does mercy triumph over judgment in your life? <clears throat> And then do you show your faith with your action? And then last week that I forgot to, you know, type in the slide. Last week we talked about um, are you partnering with God to allow him to clean up your heart and to clean up our heart of, of the sin that is there that separates us from him and what that looks like. And so this week we are, we are going to read through the scripture. It's 12 verses, James 4, 1 through 12. We're, we're going to read all 12 verses all together because it's important to see it all together in context. And then we're going to break it down a little bit and then end with an action plan of questions for how that applies to us and what God wants us to think about this week in relation to these verses. Okay, so we're going to jump right into James chapter 4, starting with verse 1. <clears throat> what causes fights and quarrels among you. Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity with God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think Scripture says without reason that he, is jealous, that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? But he gives us more grace. That is why the Scriptures say, God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from, flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves, therefore. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? <clears throat> and so as with the rest of James, there's always lots of things in these verses that we look at, right? And so there's some things in a lot of these that God is pointing out to us today. And so we're, we're going to break these down a little bit. And so, starting with just verse 1 even, what causes fights and quarrels among you? 
Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? If you were here last week, you heard me talk about how there is this battle within every one of us between our spirit that God, if we have chosen to believe in Christ and chosen to believe that Jesus is real and this God stuff is legit, right? He has awoken our spirit and, w- and w- brought us to life in our spirit. And in that, we are perfect because it is God's spirit. But we also have, because we live in this world, we have a sinful nature. We have the things just by being a part of a fallen world that are in our life. We have the things that we have chosen to do that are sin in our life. We have things that have been done against us that are in our life. So we have this war inside of us that is always battling for who's going to win, right? That good versus evil that is in so many books and movies and all the things. It's in the Bible, right? (laughs) It's where it came from originally. (laughs) Um, And so we see this, and one of the authors in the Bible, Paul, talks about this very thing in Romans 7. He says, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual. This is Paul talking. Sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know the good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good that I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. I know it's a lot of I do's and don'ts, okay? (laughs) This I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being... I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so we see this one example of of someone in the Bible that sees this at work in his life. He sees this I want to do the good things, but I can't quite get it there on my own. I do the things that I really don't want to do anymore, but I struggle, and it's there, and I keep leaning that way. And what am I to do about it? Because I keep doing the wrong thing, right? He ends with, what a wretched man am I? Who will rescue me from this? But he ends with, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Because he knows that even though he struggles and even though he falls into sin, Because he doesn't want to do it. He knows that Jesus came and took care of those things. He knows that Jesus came and redeemed him and paid the price. There is a verse in the Bible that says the the wages of sin is death, right? That Jesus saved us from those things. And he knows that. And he sees that struggle. In Colossians 3, 5 through 10, it says, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs in your earthly nature, Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used, you used to walk in these ways, in the life you once lived. But now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other. Since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge of the image of its creator. He's talking about we have these things in us. We have these things in us in, in, our, sinful nat- in our sinful nature. We had these things. But now we must strive to put these things off. That is part of the work <laughs> of being a follower of Jesus, is putting these things off, our old self, taking off the things that we know God is not calling us to anymore, and putting on the things that he is calling us to. Because we're being renewed in the knowledge of the image of his creator, right? We're being renewed in the knowledge of God and his image in our life. And it starts in our spirit and works its way out through the heart, right? And so he wants us to partner with him in that. If you jump back to James in verse 2, it says, You desire 
but do not have. So, so you kill, you covet, but you cannot get what you want. So you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. And so we look at this, and there are things that we ask for in our life. We're like, we want this thing, well, we'll, we'll, or we don't ask. We just know this is what we want, and I want that thing, but we're not asking for it. And so we're not going to get it if you don't ask for it, right? And at some point, I think of, sorry, this just, just, this just popped in my head. I think of little kids, right? Before they learn to talk, they just reach for things, right? And we just magically know what they're talking about, right? <laughs> We're just like, oh, this is what they want, maybe. I don't know. We'll try it. <laughs> and we give it to them, right? Eventually, you're like, you need to learn to ask for that, not just give it to me, right? We all expect kids to grow up and start asking for things, A, not demanding things, B, actually just, you know, asking for it, not just being like, I'm just assuming you're just going to hand it to me, so I'm just not going to ask, no, I'm not going to ask for it, <laughs> right? We have to grow up in that, and we have to grow up in that. In, and some things we ask because we have the wrong motives, so we'll ask for things that God's like, it's not time for that yet. I'm not going to give that to you, <laughs> because you're not ready, because there are some things that we ask for, even though they're good things. Sometimes we, I, I, I can catch myself, and I see this happening so much. We are praying for something to happen in our life, even though it's good. The one example that God kept giving me is so many of us pray for peace, right? I just want God's peace. I just need peace in this, in, in this situation, but God knows that if he actually gave you the peace you're asking for right now in this moment— that you won't push through whatever it is you're in the middle of and actually deal with the issue at hand. Does he want you to have peace? Yes. But does he want you to work through the issue that's going on in your life? Absolutely. He wants you to work on that thing. And I don't know about you, but I'm like, oh, I have peace about it, so then I think I'm good where I'm at, and I don't have to do anything else. God knows that. I'm asking just because I want peace and I don't want to do the hard things. I talked about that a, 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 a little bit last week about I just don't want to do hard things. That just seems like a lot of work. I catch myself saying that a lot, you know. I just don't want to do hard things. That seems like a lot. But he wants us to do that. He wants us to push through the stuff because then he can give us peace when it's time, right? And so in Matthew 7, it says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receive. And the one who seeks, finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? He wants us to ask for that stuff, but he wants us to do the stuff along the way, right? In 1 John, it says, this is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And sometimes that's where we miss it, because we don't ask what his opinion is. We just pray for something. This is what I want. This is what I want. This is what I want. And he's like, this is what you're going to get, <laughs> okay? Right now, this is what you're getting, I want you to get to that point. You can keep asking for that, yes. But this is what you're getting to help you move toward that. And so asking according to his will. And so jumping back to James, verse 4 says, You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity with God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to become a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think Scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us. We can choose to look at the world around us and what society says and what, cult, what, what, what culture says is acceptable and the way to live our life, right? We can look at that and we can choose to go along with those things. Or we can choose to go along <laughs> with the way that God wants things to be. Because if we're choosing things that are opposing to God... We're choosing sides. We're choosing the world over God, and he doesn't want us to do that. He put this spirit in us if we've chosen to believe that. He put this spirit in us, and he longs for that spirit to be 
united with him at all times in all circumstances. And he wants that for us. In Romans 12, 2, it says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. The verse right ahead of this one says, Offer up your bodies as a living sacrifice. I give my life to you, God, to do with what you want, right? Offer your body like that, your life. But do not conform to this world. Go the way that I want you to go. And let ourselves be renewed and transformed in our mind. Because our actions can change. Because our thought process changes. And our mind and our will and our emotions changes. And then our heart can change. Because we have our mind in the right place. Allowing God to renew our mind. Then we'll know what his pleasing and perfect will is. But he has grace for us when we mess it up. Jumping back to James in verse 6, he says, But he gives us more grace. This is why scripture says, God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. He has grace for us. But he also wants us to recognize when we haven't done something right and be like, yes, God, I know. This is what I did, right? That humble, coming to him. I know I'm not perfect because I'm not complete in you. I'm not in heaven with you yet. And that's not all complete, right? He wants us to submit ourselves then to God. Submit to him and whatever he's calling you to do right now. I want to do what you want me to do. I want to walk in the way that you want me to walk in my life. Resist the devil who's also trying to steer you off the path, right? And he'll flee from you. In 1 Peter 5, it says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Humble ourselves. Go to God and be like, you know the plan. I just want to do what you want to do. I want to live my life the way you, you, you want, want, want me to live my life. So that he can lift us up when it's time. He knows that time. Like when we're praying for peace. He knows when that's supposed to be there. He knows the time for that. If we just humble ourselves and let it go, and if we're worrying about the timeline, because it's in his time, due time, God's timing, which isn't always fun to wait for, but it's worth it, right? (laughs) If you start getting worried about that timeline, we'll cast all all your anxiety on him because he cares for you, because he cares for you in the middle of of what you're in. And he doesn't want you to worry about it. He, He wants you to trust that he has the plan, that he knows what's going on. In Matthew 16, it says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. Right? He's like, if you want to be my disciple, you deny themselves. So deny what you want. Deny that sinful nature in you of the things that the the, the enemy is trying to distract you from in your life or, or to in your life, right? Deny those. Take up what I have for you and follow me so that I can save your life by you giving it up to me. And there's things that he has for all of us to let go of, to deny in ourselves. Nope, I'm not going to do that. I want to do that right now, but I'm not going to do that right now. But God, what do you have for me to take up instead? And that takes trust. In Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. So many things come down to trust. So many things come down to trust. And leaning not, and because if we trust him then I don't have to understand. And I don't have to lean on just the part that I understand. Well, this I understand, so I'm going to go with that, right? But if we trust with all of our heart, even if we don't get it, and submit to him, he'll straighten the path. He'll figure it out. He'll deal with it because he knows the master plan. I say that a lot. He knows the master plan. He's got it, right? Jumping back to James, it says, Come near to God, and he will come near to you. 
Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. We just have to do our part. We just have to do our part and take that step. Take that one step. He's right there. He wants us to come near to him so he can come near to us. And purify your hearts, you double-minded. We talked about in chapter 1, this double-minded, this, this that, that is tossed to, to and fro by the waves, about asking for things and then not believing that they're actually going to happen. He's like, no, purify yourself from that. Actually, trust me. Believe what you're asking for. And don't be double-minded about it, right? Now, verse 9, I've always struggled with verse 9. I'm like, why in the world does God want us to grieve and mourn and wail, right? Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. <laughs> I've read that verse so many times, and I'm just like, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know why you would want that for us, right? And so in the last two days that I've had to look at this, <laughs> I looked into that verse specifically because I'm like, I don't understand this one. I'm not just going to fluff over it and hope no one decides to pay much attention to it, right? Because it's always bugged me. And so I was looking into this verse, and then I, I realized something when I was reading it in a commentary that grieve, mourn, and wail, change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Because so many times in our life, we're like, these are the things that make me laugh. These are the things that make me happy. These are the things that make me feel feel jo joyful. And, and we'll put things in our life, this makes me feel okay. This makes me feel good, so I'm going to go this way, right? But God's saying to us through these verses, change your laughter and replace it for mine. Change your joy, what you think brings you joy, and change it for mine. And in that, when you realize that the things that made you laugh or gave you joy that you thought were good, you can realize they're not. And you can mourn because you went the wrong direction. And you can be gloomy for a moment that you were going the wrong way. But you can turn. And you can walk out of that. And you can allow that laughter and that joy to be replaced with God's laughter and God's joy and the things that God has for you in your life by humbling yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. He will lift you up from that path and your own stuff to, to, to the path that he has for you and, and the path that he truly wants you on, right? He wants us to look at that and be like, oh no, I'm going to grieve that time I'm in my life. I'm going to mourn for the time that I lost going this way instead of this way. And knowing what I was missing now, right? But humble ourselves before him. And be like, that was wrong. I'm going this way now. You have the right path, and I'll follow you on it. Because he has things for us. We may un think we understand. This makes me happy. This is what it is, right? He's like, no, but there's other things that are different that are deeper, that are so much better than what you can do for yourself. Humble yourself for me so I can lift you up, so I can move you from that place to this place. As we continue in James, verse 11 says, Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? Right? Who are you to judge your neighbor? And so, so we look at this and we're like, well, there's other parts of the Bible, though, that say that if we're in the family of believers, we can say, hey, you're messing up in this area. Right? But this speaks to a heart attitude of like, am I going to slander and talk bad about you and all the things that you're doing in your life that I know are wrong in your life and not acknowledge the fact that I have the same things but other things, different things. I sin different than you, 
does not give me the right to slander on you about, about the things that you're doing wrong in your life. And being like, well, mine aren't as bad or mine are just different because we think ours are better for some reason or not, not as bad as other people's, right? I have a thing for you, you know. The list of sins goes this way, not this way. They're not categorized one to a thousand, okay? They're all the same. And so we can't just slander each other. We can't just beat up on each other, right? Because there's other places in the Bible, Bible, Bible that talk about this family of believers, how being a body of believers. And so they use this visual of we are all one body, right? And so sometimes you'll hear, hear people talk about, well, I'm, I might be a hand or I might be a toe or I might be a foot or a leg or a whatever, part of the body, right? It makes absolutely no sense to me why we would slander our foot and talk against our foot until it doesn't function properly and then think we can walk right. Why would we talk about someone and slander them who's part of our body and then expect them to walk with us in, in unity and walk with us with any kind of regular steps? It doesn't make any sense. And God doesn't want us to live that way. Today, my Achilles heel is flared up today, right? I can focus on it. I can be like, how dare you? <laughs> what are you doing, right? Get your act together, right? And still feel like I can, and still want to walk normal. And be like, oh, no, there it is. Who's your, your uh, uh, Achilles heel in, in the body, right? Who bugs you the most? Do you yell at them? Do you slander them? So that, so that you're limping when we're trying to move together? It makes no sense. God doesn't want that for us. The other visual I got right, right before service was, you know what? Sometimes if you sit a certain way, your leg falls asleep, right? You can tap it. Okay. Pins and needles. Oh, that hurts, right? <laughs> Wakey, wakey. That's the good judging. Hey, wake up. This is wrong. This is up. Let's get moving. Let's do it. And not beating on it going, why are you asleep? Fine, just stay asleep. Right? And again, walking with a limp because we can't walk right. Because we're not treating people right and we're not doing it right. Another, another visual that Jesus used in the Bible was why do you call out the speck in your neighbor's eye and ignore the plank in your own eye, right? First take the plank out of your own so you can see clearly to help them get the speck out of theirs. Don't slander each other. <laughs> There's only one lawgiver and judge. The one who is able to save and destroy, right? Or who are you to judge your neighbor? We can move on because I accidentally had an extra verse 12. It's fine. <laughs> in Romans 12, in Romans 2, it says, You therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself. Because you who pass judgment do the same things. Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. Because so many times when we're talking down about somebody, when, when we catch ourselves in that slander and in that gossip and stuff, we catch ourselves and we're like, is that based on truth? In our heart? On God's truth? Or is that just our opinion because we want to point that out so we can ignore our own, right? But God's judgment is based on truth. God's judgment is based on truth. And so we look at these verses that, that, that we looked at, at, at today, these 12 verses, and the action plan that goes with that, what that can apply to our life like, right? Sometimes this is steps, sometimes it's questions, sometimes, a lot of times it's questions, because God uses questions on me all the time. <laughs> is that really accurate? I don't think so. <laughs> He'll ask me questions, right? And so one of the questions that he, he brought to me yesterday was, how is God calling you to humble yourself and submit to him? So we looked at the ad, 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 these verses today, and we all have areas of our life 
that, that, that we struggle in and that we need to submit to him and that we're worrying about something or stressing about something or something's happening or something's hard or something's whatever. And maybe right now, you know, life's okay. And that's okay too. But you got to ask God if there's anything else that he wants you to be looking at. So can we ask ourselves today, how is God calling you to humble yourself to him and submit to him in an area? And that could be different for every single person in this room. Because God knows exactly where you're at, and he knows your heart, right? The other question that God had for us today, that at first I could not figure out the correlation. I was like, I'll put it in there, but okay. (laughs) Is why are you seeking God? Because we can look at these things and we're like, yes, we shouldn't fight. Yes, we shouldn't do these. We need to humble and submit ourselves before God because we need to pray right with the right motives and all the things, right? But why? And that's a question for you to ask in your heart for him, with him. Because sometimes, like I said earlier, we'll pray for the peace because we're seeking the peace. We're not seeking the God who brings the peace. And sometimes we're seeking the benefits and not the actual God. Because the other question that was like paired up with this one in my head was, when is enough for you? When is it enough? When have I blessed you enough? When have I given you enough that you'll trust me? When will I give you enough blessings that you'll decide okay, I think we're in a good place now. I think I can trust you now. To the God that created the whole universe, to the God that created you and your inmost being when you weren't even born yet, to the God that sent a part of himself to the earth to live a life that no one would understand, to go through things that we can't even dream of, to die a horrible death, When is enough? What is enough? Is it enough that he died for you and redeemed you and paid the price for all of the sins of all people for all time? That in and of itself should be enough. But we get caught up in the, but I don't feel this and I don't feel that and I want this and I want that. That asking for the wrong motives for our own pleasure, right? I want the comfort and I want the peace and I want the hope that comes from it, not just because you're an amazing God that cares about me, one tiny speck on this planet who created the whole universe, right? But why are we seeking? Are we seeking for the benefits? Are we seeking because he's the God that loves us and desires to have relationship because he created us for his pleasure, And I know there's times that I'm not making that pleasurable for him. But he loves me anyway. But he loves me anyway. Are we seeking him for him or for what he can give to us? What's in it for me? We're so spoiled in this country. We're so spoiled here. We're here today, gathering together able to worship together, to learn and teach together in a building, in a public place. Not in a basement. Not having a gag gathering at someone's house. And not actually able to talk about the actual word God in public, but using some other word so that people don't know what we're talking about. We don't have to talk in code. We don't have to worry about being thrown in jail for that. We, we don't have to, have to worry about, about, uh, about being beaten for that. We don't have to, we have the freedom here to do, to do this, to live this life in the light and in the public. When is enough? For people other places that are hiding in basements, that are pushed away from their family, God is enough. The God of the Bible that they have read about, that they have learned about, that they're seeking is enough. When is enough for you? When is enough for me? Why am I seeking? There's a God that has such a love for us individually that he desires relationship. 
He wants that connection. He wants that relationship with us. And he wants us to be all in just for him. If nothing else goes right in my entire life, if that peace that I want never comes in the way that I think it should, Is this still worth it? Absolutely. Because I have a God that's with me no matter what. That even if I'm alone, and even if nothing else is left, even if everyone that I know in my support system is gone, I am not alone. Because I have a God that tells me I'm never alone, that he doesn't leave me or forsake me, that he is always there to walk me through anything. Why are we seeking? And when is enough enough for us? How is God calling you today to humble yourself and submit to him? And I want us to think about these things. And I know for a long time we've closed with a song, but we're not closing with a song again today. We're just not supposed to do it. And this would be an amazing day for it, I think, for us to like mull it over and actually talk to God right now in the moment. But he also calls us, as I talked about, to be a part of the body, to live this out with each other. Because I can tell you, <laughs> I can tell Charlene something. Hey, God's calling me to submit in this area. And you know what? I know she's going to ask me about it. So then I'm accountable. Like, she's going to ask me, and I'm not going to have an answer if I don't actually live that way. Right? It's the whole point of the series. Do it. It's not enough to know it. You have to live it. We can support one another in living it. It's way better in community than on our own little island that we think we're on. That isn't really. We're just facing all the water instead of the actual land that's behind us with all the people. <laughs> we have people with us. We have each other. Talk to each other. No, we're not going to play a song. But talk to the person next to you or someone behind you in the next row, in the next whatever. Talk to each other. We're in this together. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to close out. Father God, I thank you so much for bringing us here today. I thank you for the love that you have for us, that you love being around us, even when we're messing it up, that you have such a love for us, that you just desire to be united with your spirit that you put in us for a reason. You put it in us so that we could be one with you. And I just thank you so much for that. I thank you, Jesus, for everything that you did. That is enough for us. Holy Spirit, that we would be listening for the ways that you're tapping on our heart this week to humble ourselves and submit to God and the ways that you can tell us about that because you know the deep things of God. That we will listen for your still small voice. That we, that, that we will walk in step with you today. God, I thank you for every person in this room and every person hearing my voice, for the blessing they are in our life. Our life here at Grace and our life in the world, Lord. I don't care if I've never met them. They're, they're a blessing, and I thank you for them so much that you would be with us as, as we go from this place, that we would learn, that we would walk in step with you. That we would make that connection. That we, we would keep that connection there, Lord. That we would walk in genuine faith. I just thank you so much for your ever-present presence with us. That you're always with us. In Jesus' name, amen.